bad intention. My name is Joe Harrington, and I'm one of the Vice Presidents of Professional Development for the Business Week team. And I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here today for what is another huge milestone for the Business Week family and the College of Business. This year marks the 45th year that Business Week has been a part of Illinois State University's campus. It has grown and changed throughout the years. But one thing that has always remained constant, developing the professional skills of our students to carry into the real world. <laughs> Before I hand things over to Dean Simon to introduce our keynote speaker this year, I'd like to thank our sponsors for Business Week's events. A big thank you goes to our platinum partner uh, for Business Week this year, Nycor Gas. We would also like to thank our lead partners for 2024, ADM, John Deere, and Penske. These organizations have worked with us closely on our equity, diversity, and inclusion events this past year. Without the support of companies and organizations like these, Business Week could not be what it is. Thank you so very, very much for your support. This year, we also have a new internal partner joining us to promote professionalism and soft skills to our students, Business Bird Ready. Business Bird Ready is a badging program designed to ensure our students have the value and competencies and remarkable skills needed for a successful career. By allowing students to participate in a variety of experiential learning activities throughout their time as a College of Business student. Thank you for contributing to Business Week and trusting us as the Business Week team to host educational and important events. Now, I'll be passing the baton to our Dean of the Accredited College of Business. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Salon. Thank you, Joe. And good afternoon. It's wonderful to see a full house. This is great. It is my privilege to introduce our business keynote speaker, Mr. Robert Bush. The president of Roche Enterprises. Mr. Roche is a senior entrepreneur, civic leader, and philanthropist. As founder and president of Roche Enterprises, he has launched, managed, and invested in more than 100 successful global ventures, including Ocon Marketing in Japan, Acorn International in China, ISC Food. China and the United States, and Caché Hotels and Resorts in China. In the U.S., his business and real estate interests include San Paulo Resort, Galvan Partners, and Red Horse Performance. Mr. Roche is a dedicated civic leader who has served as a civic and business representative for the United States, in Japan, and in China, and has participated as a donor and advisor to many nonprofit organizations. He is a senior advisor to the Quad Investors Network, which is a nonprofit that facilitates the development of emerging technologies across the Indo Pacific. He also serves as a board of the Center for New American Security and founded the Business Forward Foundation. In 2010, President Obama named him to the U.S. Trade Representatives Advisory Committee for Trade Policy and Negotiations, which is a committee on which he served until 2014. Mr. Roche is also a passionate philanthropist who is involved extensively in nonprofit organizations and focused on enhancing education improving international relations and building strong, sustainable communities. Endowments from Roche have established a chair for interreligious research at Nanzan University in Japan and a Master of Laws in International Business Transactions at the University of Denver, Stern College of Law. Mr. Roche earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Japanese Studies at Illinois State University and earned his JD at the University of Denver. He is married with three children and spends time in China, Japan, and the United States. He is fluent in Japanese and proficient in Mandarin Chinese. Please join me in a hearty round of applause to welcome this <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for 
kind of production? How about that, Dr. Sonoff? The School of Business for the invitation. And thank, thank all of you for taking time out of your day to come and listen to me. It's great to be back here on campus, even though it's very, very different campus than the campus I was I understand that Business Week is one of the most important events of the year at the College of Business. Its goal is to promote professional development and give, all, and give you all insights into the real world. I am honored to be included in the part of this. I just want to say something off right here. I know this is the big auditorium, and I remember when I was here in the room about attending things in the big auditorium. Sleeping's okay. Yeah. Drooling is probably a lot of it's on yourself, but snoring? <laughs> That's not cool. That's not cool. My mother might be listening to this, and if she hears the snoring, it's going to cost me. So, I think my snoring's okay. When I was a senior, I attended one of these speeches. I don't remember the gentleman's name. All I remember is this guy standing in front of me and talked about how he attended ISU. And then he built this big business. And the business had just something to do with stuff that he did. And, and what a story this guy told. Um, he was very successful and seemed to be a regular guy. The main thing I took away from that was that if that guy can do it, <laughs> my guy can do it. I think there is possibility that, so, so that is really my message today to all of you. You know, one thing I'd like you to take away from this warm speech today is that whatever level of success I've achieved, you absolutely can do the same or more. Okay, so when I was young, um, I was not a very good planner. And today I was asking you, and let me do this, let me do this, and then all these questions. And the reality is, um, I not, I, I, it's not that I was a bad planner, it's just very seldom that I had a plan. I grew up <laughs> in the sub south suburbs of Chicago with eight or nine children. Being at the end of the family, there wasn't a real need for me to have a plan. You <laughs> <laughs> just kind of have fun. You know, and besides, very seldom did anybody ever ask me, hey, what do you want? <laughs> so, really, I didn't need a plan. Um, however, I was an expert at adapting to the situation I found myself in, which was always very helpful. I attended Marist High School and um, didn't really have a plan to go to college necessarily, but everybody was there to pay So I just, you know. And so here, here, so I applied to ISU, and at that time, this was 1980, and I applied. If you apply to ISU, you can So, but I don't think if I applied today, I'd be sitting up here. Right um, so I found myself here at ISU, and my journey began. Um, the time I spent at ISU um, really made me who I am today. I wasn't the most academic. And I came from a challenging high school, so pretty much I closed up the first year. But my eyes were open to all different kinds of things you could do, and that was available to the university. <coughs> As you all know, you need to choose a major when you begin at university. So you can start, so you can start the course track. If you don't have a plan, this is a little hard to do. I know many of you can Mind. It really wasn't me. But one thing that I was focusing on was being in the business school required accounting 101. I wasn't still doing that. I was told that's very hard to focus. So I was picking a major that you thought about accounting 101. So I became an economist. <laughs> um, when I was a sophomore, a guest speaker came in and talked to him in history class about the um, summer like, study tour of China. And at that time, China was just opening up some very, very exciting things. So I, had, I put this you know, one line plan together. I was going home, I was going to call some 
Christmas time and talk to my father and say, I'm going to China next summer. And I don't know if any of the younger folks who know who Mike Tyson is, but Mike Tyson used to always say, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and my punch in the face was my father said, hey, great idea, but how are you going to pay for school? They're going to be in China during the summer. I had a construction job. Over the summer, my own construction company. So I had to come back and figure it out. So before long, I found myself in the name of the building right behind me for some other all of the uh, paraphernalia from um, for, for ISU. And I went to the uh, study abroad office. Um, I was learning about all the different places, places you can go. And it's a little embarrassing. But the economics drove my decision on where to go. And at the time, Japan was the most economic. Um, the one caution my father did give me when I was going to go to Japan was that he reminded me that when I was in high, high school, I actually fought Spanish. And he didn't say, I can't go. He said, you should try to learn a little Japanese. So, you know, this is a note he looked at me, he said, go have fun, but in the office, he said, you have no business. <laughs> and going to learn Japanese. Um, so, okay, I went back, I came to school, and, and coincidentally, the Professor Ray, who uh, gave me speech about China, was also teaching Japanese. So I took my father's advice, I signed up for the course of his Japanese, which was extremely difficult, you know, best I could do. I got my grade, and Dr. Ray said, son, I don't think you want to see. You don't deserve to see. I'm going to make the grades. If I give you the grade you deserve, you're going to be disheartened. You might not be judging. But you'll have to see that you better turn it on or you're going to grow. So, it was the most confident. I was on my way to Japan. And, um, there's nothing more than really a plan to turn it into kind of a long road. So, so, but when I first got to Japan, in August of my junior year, 1993, and some of you may be too young to, to know the 1939 version of the Wizard of Oz. But when Dorothy stepped into the top, she went from black and white to And when it was, when I got to Japan, it was a county piece of gold. Everything was different. Everything looked different. The architecture was different. The language was different. I couldn't remember <coughs> else. The money was different. Everything was different. Over, over the years, although I didn't have plans, I always felt that it was very good. And I didn't. I my way through an awful lot, which I continued, but there was no things. There was just a way, way, way to do it. So while I was there, um, so what happened to me next was an event that changed my life. And um, I was at the University of Japan, and I met a girl in the cafeteria. She barely spoke Japanese. I barely spoke English. She was not even an English major. She was a little bit Spanish. Mm -hmm. Iron was coming. So you could barely talk to each other. Um, but it was the start of our relationship. And at that time, my eyes were finally opened to my lack of having any real plan. And that I was not really anywhere close to being a serious person. I started to have serious thoughts about what I wanted to be when I grew up. Over time, the answer, although vague, was materially more obtainable, and it was that I wanted to be someone that this person would possibly like me. From that moment, I took more seriously every aspect of my existence. This is almost like the difference between BC and AD, the watershed moment of my life. I really hope that all of you have some similar type of catalyst event. And the earlier in your life, the better. 
It doesn't need to be a car bomb. It could be anything of a hundred of a hundred things, and could be a catalyst to further jumpstart your plans. I hope this happens to all of you. Life got better for me when I started to take it more seriously. I went back to ISU from my, from my senior year, and after staying an entire year in Japan, due to the university's great contract major program, I was able to get a second major in Japanese studies. With this, with my economics major, I was able to have a double major on my resume, and this was very helpful later when I played the law school. From this point, I knew that I wanted Japan, my girlfriend, in my life. And that led me to my first plan. First detail that I would say. It was clear that marrying foreigners was around the money. They liked you if you were coming over for dinner at all, good enough. But marrying into the family was a whole other thing. I felt compelled to improve myself again and decided to go to law school. The second major in Japanese studies really helped because at that time in the early 80s, mid 80s, um, Japan was very, very hot, and it also helped me get a, a bit of a scholarship myself because I was paying my way through, through, through school. At this, at this point, my goal was getting back to Japan and marrying my girlfriend. Long story short, I felt that if I could be a lawyer and go back to Japan, at the very least, my wife's parents would tell their names. <laughs> In the end, it all worked out. I got the girl with the three grandkids, and we were on our way. I must tell you that I had zero interest in being a lawyer, however. Um, several of my older siblings went to law school, many of the friends of the lawyers, and, you know, it seemed like a grueling way to go. For me, it was just a way to legitimize myself in the Japanese context. So just to clarify, now I have a great relationship with them. Great relationship with them. Two factors. One is they didn't actually have financially support me. And secondly, we have kids. And if anyone's going to get into a situation like that, children are a great network. The parents and the neighbors. I was still without any real plan for a business or how to make money, but I was very lucky. Right around this time, the yen became 50% stronger against the dollar. That led to great opportunities in parallel inputs. This was my first introduction to an arbitrage opportunity into the countries that I could actually act upon. Basically, I would buy activity of my dependents, the independents in America, the UK, especially the world. And move them to Japan and sell them at wholesale for profit. And the beauty of starting at zero is that any amount of money that's actually coming in after you have been for eight years is a lot of money. Putting a working amount of it is a lot. They were very, these were very unbelievable times and was the first time. Um, that it kind of dawned on me that I would have had my business in the back. And that, the fact that I was making money was a good feeling, but it was an even better feeling to be something that I had in the business with me, based on my background, based on who I was in the business. I can tell you um, how, many, how many times I went into the community before I got serious. And we're talking about what's happening, and they look at me and say, You regret. I didn't clutch. And it is that surprise that is, is enjoyable to me and drives me. This, too, I must say, um, again, we had no plan. We were serendipitous, serendipitous, serendipitously introduced to a TV, Japanese TV shopping company. That wanted to buy our Tiffany. The only requirement was that I had to go on TV and sell it. I didn't really like to do that. You know, I mean, what was part of the deal? He said, no more TV, I don't like it. 
So I was born to you. I must say that I really like doing going on TV. I'm not that really good at it. Um, it's just, you know, I'm getting nervous and going back. This is stand still and I would be going like this. Um, but being in front of the camera is not easy or as, or as glamorous as, as it looks. Everything was in Japanese. There was a time limit, things had to be said a specific way, etc., etc., and it was quite nervous. Um, we would shoot one show and then air it for about a month or six weeks. And then make it up. The pressure was compounded by the fact that my mother in law, who would watch TV and see me on TV, would see the show during the week and then she would critique my performance on <laughs> Sunday at family dinner. Um, all in all, good advice, but she would chide me sometimes for not listening and incorporating her advice into my. <laughs> The next plan, and usually it was because she was watching the movie. So it was all of that. So, you know, we, then, then we found another product after the tip of was watches, and it was a kind of a character of a cat's face with an eye in the middle that moved on the dial and followed the mouse's second hand around the clock. Very nice, very good, but for some reason, I thought she saw this as well. For some reason, it exploded, and, and everybody in Japan seemed to love this watch. So then, we were pressured by the shopping to find more products. And right around this time, Idea, so take your own money and do it yourself. 
and then the rest of the system. Um, at the beginning, this was the beginning of Shah Japan, the creation of an internet for business in Japan. As I said, the US TV shopping industry is years ahead of the Japanese TV shopping industry, basically because of um, the D uh, regulation of the And they were doing it. And that was really the key difference. And to spot that difference was also very, you know, be able to be there when it happened was also quite lovely. And today, we are literally, literally on every TV station in Japan, there's 200 stations. We buy one full page or two full page, every week and probably every newspaper of our Japan. And I, I like the data that has to be posted to 30 or 40 percent of all the stations. Again, I didn't have a plan to do this. I didn't write a plan to do this. It just kind of evolved. What I do is I keep myself open to possibility and this that it could all work out. It was a positive thing. One step at a time, one day at a time, and keep making the best of the situation I found myself in. Besides all the financial success, the most delicious part is that I absolutely have the only business in the time that has the number one business. Basically, is a Very few people know the company is just start So, let me share a couple takeaways. I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit because I know I'm going to put questions at the end of this. So I've shared my story to this point. There's a couple of takeaways from my experience. So the first um, is that it's hard to do all of this on your own. Um, for me, the partners I've had along the way have been instrumental to the success of, of my businesses. The two partners that come to mind are one is Tadashi Nakamura, and the other, um, he was my partner in the local marketing shop. And Terry Hill, who was my partner in HR Consultants. Um, HR Consultants was first really successful business that they put together. And what we did was we help expats find housing and relocate to New York. And New York is way out of the way. It's not Tokyo, it's not a really good place. It's right off the road and it's cool, but they were locking and, and breaking out and just setting up the business system. Um, and again, the side note is, well, again, this was from the FSX program that we shared with um, and the paper was being finally sold to Japan. So the timing was very good to the Japanese side of the real estate. I had very good connectivity with the um, with the Americans because I was helping them with the American business community book, which is basically the of commerce. And and Harry and I were very same same age, same school year out here at the age wise, um, but we were really good at that. Two young guys, both spoke Japanese, both married Japanese, of course, with the moment. And we looked at each other, and for the very first time we said, so we really just love each other, but we can't see it. And we chose one. You know, she's lovely. <laughs> and, and the cool part was he was so, he was very similar but very different. He was a Cornell guy, he could be right very well. I'm not a Cornell guy. I um, don't like writing so much other than reading so much as you can tell in my speech. Um, but I was good at verbal communications, the sales guy, and a little more rough and humble. And between the two of us, we made it work. And it was quite amazing that the, ch the guy who was running my computer, running great hand, asking her advice, and I was like, what is that? What is that? What is that? And then they give you a big pot of money to, to solve their problem. And again, Absolutely, the lot you got is the great thing as a no business. I had no business with those guys. But in the end, it all worked out. Um, 
In the case of not the girls, but not all the time, the whole Japanese guy, didn't really speak English. Parents speak English. Some of the people like Americans. Um, and um, this is very rough. And however, um, he could handle the Japanese stuff. And the TV shop, this guy was a little more rough and humble. He used to get a deal with the TV station, get a deal with the shit that he got to deal with. So it was a lot of things that were just, just out, out of my great comfort zone. And I could take care of the real side and agree with him. Uh, you know, we didn't always agree on all the issues. We fight like cats and dogs. And you know, this is another fortunate thing that came up is when the argument from the English and English, we know that we were trying to say these things in a way <coughs> causing the kind of reaction in a way. My wife's in between is to try to do the best translation. When we were in the fall of these arguments, none of this thing was with no words. This is not the Japanese language for it to exist. So the beauty of it, he didn't really know what I was saying. And I really didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> so we were in the list, and it was easy to kiss and make up and just kind of come out. There was no permanent damage done. Um, and he was very well. I remember. And, um, Japan was money for guys and yeah, half a day the And you gotta remember Japan was coming, you know, got to struggle back after the war, so they work and there was no easy way. And, and you had to do it. And you know that came into the country. It was long, strong bands about how it's going to get married and you can say everything you need to get something off and not listening to this thing so much it wasn't here. I got my taste. 
And then as it turns out, both of those companies sub out of the business after about three and a half years, and Kirk and me are buying the lion's share of the capital dollars. And this just is one of these things where you just, you know, have to keep, keep going and keep pushing. You might lose a couple battles, but if you stay in long enough, you can win the game. And by and large, if it's a business process, how to do something, then I learned that the counselor can do it. You know, it doesn't matter what the color is, it doesn't matter what the culture is, everybody wants to get it. And you get that same kind of issue. It doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't, it doesn't. You know, everybody pretty much eats the same thing. Chicken, meat, vegetables. And what I always try to do is just respect and even embrace the local customer and try to find out the amount of traffic. Find a hole in the customer process and improve the problems, and that's where margins find. When people tell you that this is not the way it's done, don't be over aggressive and you know, challenging, challenging it, but certainly if you feel you have a better way, Figure it out. And then you guess, you know, this is a risk. That's not a risk. You know it's 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 a risk. And, you know, I just always thought more times it worked than it did because it was a big golden dress. And then, on this cell phone, this is you have to. Not forget the local market because when I was reading the American business practices, I always kind of equated the take the American practice and the politics of the trial forces. You've got certainly in Japan, and you just a little from the sauce on the plan. They taste it, and they would just feel a little more comfortable. And it really wasn't done, it wasn't influencing what would be done, but it would. Just, just the, the, for, for it to be accepted. And, and to me, that was very, very important. Um, and because the reality is everything is always changing, and opportunities come to the people who are changing. The key is to be respectful and patient. And I know that the main innovations I brought to the Japanese market would not have been, we had certain. <coughs> If I didn't have a really longer term, because I don't know if this was told to me, I don't know exactly what told me this, but I'm just going to give up a lot of time. If you want to be handsome, I can sound. No. But if you give me a little bit of time, to me, in my world, it makes way better than nothing. And I think mean, yours must be the same. And then just one thing else before I kind of get to, to um, the next part is this, is that I just, you know, I'm going to take an introduction. There's not a lot of guys like me standing here saying like, the like, is a bad housing. There's lots of mistakes along the way. Tons of mistakes along the way. We don't want to talk about much, but they're real. <coughs> but it, it sounds like a cliche, a complete cliche, but it is through failure that we learn. There's no doubt about it. And the key is try to try to just fail less as you go. So you said that is like just way, way easier. So, Alright, so I'm gonna try to save some time. I'm gonna cut a piece out because we want to save some time. So, okay, so I'm just going to jump to the conclusion here. Um, so, conclusion, believing in yourself is key. Believing in yourself and don't go back. There are enough people in the world that will tell you you can't. So my advice to you is don't do that. You need to start with, you don't need to start with passion for something to start. Just keep moving. Passion will find you if you are emotional. How do I know the I don't know why I'm um, 
I am just so happy that I didn't see my mom in the basement. Trying to figure out what I wanted before I got home. So, don't be confused when people say, look at that sheet, look at that sheet. Um, not everyone needs to start with that sheet. There's something to start with. You should start with you. Um, also, we live in a very divided society. Just because someone doesn't think the way you think, doesn't mean necessarily you are bad person. Of course, there's bad people out there. They're by and large, most people are good. What they believe, for various reasons, is what they believe. I know nothing about I knew nothing about Japan before I went. And I learned almost every aspect of my adult professional business life in from Japan and China. I learned diversity, the perspective can be helpful in all walks of life. And it's very clear and very helpful to me. I grew up in a very white, middle class suburb. And when I got to high school, there were people of all types of races, cultures, so right next to me, living right next to me. Most of my surprise, all of the stereotypical things who these people were supposed to be doing, and see. And it was interesting how all of those people, the more I interacted, kind of still became us. And it wasn't us and them, it was just um, I, you know, I ended up living primarily the last four years of my life overseas, in countries where everything was different. Specifically, I'm half Italian, I'm half And I always liked to kind of get the best of both. But when I grew up, you know, in the class of the red box, we had a um, you know, the rest of us and the change of the same side. I always think that it can be better for the fire. And the caddy is lost. But I don't know. Red sauce and butter on the caddy is good for the taste. So, what I tried to do, one of my philosophies is to take the best of the whole group. Don't try to see what this better than that better. I was asked, Oh, 10 times a day. Where do you like to look back? Japan? America? And the answer is what? If you can figure it out, it's all the results. Um, one thing I encourage all of you to do is to talk to someone who might not say what you want them to say, but that you feel is a good person. Listen to who they are before. You don't. You don't have to agree with them in the end, but you may learn from them. Different people from different countries, with different cultures, that we have all this fascinating. I know, and I know this to be a fact, that if you look to be fascinated by difference, instead of going by it, it will only make you laugh. And I think it was so, um, looking back and simply just at Japan and the U.S., the two simple contrasts that make us very different. In the U.S., it's all about rights, and in Japan, it's all about responsibility. In America, it's all about and in Japan, it's all about Both of these are fundamentally different, yes, they can both exist. So, that is incredibly necessary. Is that is that this is not gonna you know be one of these you know you can do it and you have some guy he gave me the advice and he says wealthy people are both and your wealth comes from can come from any family money, wealth, spirituality, whatever you have is wealth. And if you want to acquire more of whatever you value. That is wealth, fighting the country that you need. Zolf is a great leader. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. And if there are any questions, um,
There's so many questions today that I get more mics. <laughs> for your time for being here. Um, my question is, what were some things that you didn't consider initially when you were bringing your companies internationally, and how did you learn from those mistakes? So, I would say that I, I would take international concepts and bring them to Japan, and then I would take the same concepts and bring them to um, China. When I tried to bring those concepts to further countries, didn't work out so well. So it's very good. Um, and I, I just think that my lack of really having super thorough planning skills and really even the temperament that the kind of be planning wasn't helpful. But I really, my business is in most businesses that, from, from a high school business school perspective, it's you're American centric. So you take this wonderful American idea and take it on. That's not all. I, I had a very personal reason to live in Japan. I had a big deal. So I just figured out what I was doing there. So I don't have a international business. And the things I do in America are completely unrelated to what I do in Japan. Also, kind of you. I just want to start off by thanking you for coming out and this opportunity to put this in your perspective. Uh, during your speech, you talked a lot about how your, your track record going through and how you started from different companies and went in different industries and everything kind of fell in place. The other time where you put the work in and stuff that was expected, and how did you rebound from that? You know, I mean, I'm still doing that now. You know, the hospitality business I got into, I thought was going to be better. I was going to do a better job than I did. Than I did. You know, in a way, and get out of the Ungraceful is the way that I There's no graceful way to get out of the way. I'm going to just ask you to get out of the way. It's such an unpleasant feeling that you should get that not to have that experience in hand. So that's how you learn. Hi, Mr. Roche, thanks so much for coming to talk to us. Uh, so you started your career in the arbitrage business. Um, what are your thoughts on the internet competing away many of those opportunities in that marketplace? And um, <clears throat> what sort of opportunities 
is to receive job for it in arbitration? I would say that the internet opens up the arbitrage opportunity for a period of time. So arbitrage isn't given um, speed as much as it is recognizing that there's a big between two markets. So I would say in terms of opportunity, um, if I'm standing in the circle and there's somebody else standing in the circle because we're in such a narrow space, the opportunity for arbitrage comes to nothing. Or if I'm in the circle and then I can kind of then move over to this circle and I can observe the different climates and cultures and situations in both circles, then a, an arbitrage opportunity opens up for me. And if some people just their life is in that circle, or their life is in this circle, the arbitrage opportunity doesn't really arise. So with arbitrage, it's really being in two places at one time that have a material enough difference to where there's a bit, you know. But I mean, so it's not the internet. The internet's just a tool. The internet can give you maybe the, the illusion that you're sitting in two different areas, but depending on what it is, um, you know, like my, my son, um, he was very, very involved in the arbitrage between uh, Bitcoin and U.S. price in Japan. But that's a complicated transaction, you know, and, and you yeah. have a lot. You were lucky with that because we had situations in both countries, but Again, this is why my point was it was the first arbitrage, you know, with these Tiffany's and Coppella beans that I was able to actually to execute on, that I was able to benefit from. I could see in Japan that you know, Coca Cola was $2, but it was 75 cents here. I couldn't use the container of Coca Cola. I couldn't buy it. I couldn't Coca Cola got rules. So, I mean, so it's, part of it is just recognizing it, but then being able to execute. So, just again, it's all, again, it's all about where you are 
So I'll be walking away, so I'll be running away. <laughs> what do I need to do? But I was there. But, uh, well, I'll just say go to the place you want to go. We were talking about this earlier. Um, and then if you just speak the language, it's not enough. You know, I mean, I do a lot of guys that speak really, really, really good Japanese. That's all we can do. We couldn't do the count, right? We couldn't do the business. We couldn't do the process management. Great. Now, who takes care of that? So, I, I, I do think learn, learn languages and teach you perspective that you just can't get other places that you can do them good at go there at least for you. Not for everyone. But it was it. Thank you.